Greek New Testament Sentence Diagramming. This is part seven of our how-to series. As always, we'll begin with a little review. Back in part five, we learned the symbols series, these branches used to show parallel construction of various kinds of series. So you see them set in blue text here. There are two different series. Uh, the verbs are a series of three, paraleben, anakoresen, and ain. Uh, you see those here in this portion of the diagram. And then paraleben has a series of two objects, and those appear here. Sometimes we have a construction that requires a stub on both the left and right ends of the series branch. That's no problem. A new symbol we had in part six was the appositive symbol. An appositive is a noun function that expands another noun or substantive by renaming it with an alternative designation. So for example, we had the phrase in the days of Herod the king, with the king being the appositive. The prepositional phrase would be diagrammed like this, and the appositive to Herod is set right beside it with an equal sign connecting the two. The second example is a little different. It says, John the Baptist arrives. And here we have a whole clause, John arrives. But as you can see, we cannot place an appositive on the right side of the word John. So here we just put the appositive on the left side. So you see, you can't always read the sentence diagrams from left to right. You're always looking for baselines that show the kernels of clauses. And those baselines can expand to the left, to the right, downward, even upward and you start from the center of those baselines and you work out through whatever appendages may attach to that particular clause. In part six, we also considered how to differentiate between attributive constructions and appositional constructions. An attributive is an adjective function that expands a noun or other substantive with a simple descriptive word or phrase, such as a large tree. Large is a simple descriptive word for the noun tree. An appositive is a noun function that expands another noun or substantive by renaming it with an alternative designation. So for example, Paul the Apostle. Apostle is a noun, not an adjective, and it provides an alternative designation for the proper name Paul. And we worked through the tests that we can apply to determine whether a particular word in view that we sense is either attributive or appositional. There are some tests we can apply to determine which it is. So if the word in question is a noun, then it must be an appositive because Greek nouns are not used as adjectives. If the word could stand alone in place of the other word, it is most likely an appositive. The apostle could almost always stand in place of the word Paul. If the word in view is an adjective or a participle in a standard attributive construction, then most likely that is its use. It's the attributive use of that adjectival word. If it's a pronoun, it is most likely attributive. I should perhaps clarify in this video that personal pronouns will not typically be used this way, but demonstrative pronouns, interrogative pronouns, indefinite pronouns, uh, these are often used with an adjectival function. If the word you're looking at would be awkward if you set it off with a comma, then it's probably attributive. So you would not put a comma between large and tree if you're talking about a large tree, but a comma between Paul and the apostle would seem quite natural. That comma would not be necessary, but it wouldn't do any violence to the construction. On to new material now for part seven. Let's get into that expanded coverage of the series symbol. Sometimes the conjunctions binding together the items in a series are working together in a pair. Some examples of this kind of construction would be a repeated chi, meaning both and. Similarly, ude can be repeated with the idea neither nor. I think the best way to present these paired conjunctions is to stack them vertically within the conjunction space in that series branch symbol. So here you have series items one and two in a parallel construction, and the conjunction in the central portion of that symbol is simply split into two lines with the first conjunction written on the first line and the second on the second line. So let's look at some examples. We've been taking a lot of our examples from early in the book of Matthew, but in this video I found it necessary to branch out and take them from many places in the New Testament. So here's one from John 11. The text reads, the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. You see the two chi's, chi ta tapon, chi ta ethnos, both the place and the nation. Here's how that would look in diagram form. 
the Romans, and here's a series of verbs, will come and take away. But the series I'm really interested in is the objects of Arusen, where we have both the place and the nation. And then the hemon naturally goes with both of those nouns. It's our place, our nation. So you can see that hemon is diagrammed so that it connects to the stub on the left of the series branch. In that connection, it shows that it modifies both nouns, topon and ethnos. So as we move down the baseline to the right, and we pass the verb slot into the object slot, where there's a single object line, the object, however long a series it may be, is conceived of in its unity. And so any modifier for the whole series can then connect to that one unified line. Then, after that point, it branches into the various elements of the series. If we had a modifier for just topon, it would connect here, just under that word. If we had a modifier for just ethnos, it would connect here under just that word. All right, another example from the book of Acts. And both Silas and Timothy remained there. Here the construction is a little different. It's the word te instead of chi in the first conjunction position. But it's the same construction. The first te here is not the one that's in view. That's the te that opens the clause. This te, the second one, corresponds to te on the top line of the conjunction space. And the chi corresponds to the second conjunction. So we have a series of two subjects, both Silas and Timothy, remained there. All right, here's an example with a different word, eta, again doubled. Paul says in Philippians 1.20 that Christ will be magnified in my body, whether through life or through death. So eta, eta, whether, or. And you probably can visualize the diagram fairly well now, but it's a little different this time because now we have prepositional phrases as the items in the series. So Christ will be magnified in my body, simple prepositional phrase. But then we have these two prepositional phrases bound together with this pair of conjunctions. So we have a single shelf that begins to form here. But as we move horizontally across that shelf, we branch into the series symbol with the paired conjunctions in their ordinary position here. So whether through life or through death. The common construction with men and de is very similar. In Matthew 3, John the Baptist is speaking. I, on the one hand, that's men, baptize you in water for repentance. But on the other hand, that's the de, the one coming after me will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So a little bit longer sentence and a little bit more complicated diagram this time. It's the two independent clauses that form a series this time. And so our series branch and its conjunctions are all the way over on the left side of the diagram. So on the one hand, I baptize you in water under repentance. De, but on the other hand, the one coming after me will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. We will have a couple of examples now where the first word is not technically a conjunction, but it seems still best to me to put it together with the conjunction in a pair. These examples set up a pair where the first item in the series is negated, and then the second item is set in contrast to it. So Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus says, Not on bread only will man live, but on every word that goes out through the mouth of God. So not on bread only, but on every word. Again, we have prepositional phrases in view here. The kernel of the clause is the man will live, and then we have it expanded with this pair of prepositional phrases using the preposition epi. Not on bread alone, but in contrast, on every word going out through the mouth of God. Similarly, we have the expression not only, but also. So we have a not but, but it's modified a little bit this time so that it's not only, but also. This is not such a stark contrast of mutual exclusives. But here the first is taken for granted. The second goes beyond it and adds an additional element. In Hebrews 12, 26, the Lord says, I will shake not only the earth, he will shake the earth, but not only the earth, but also the sky. Uh, the heaven, if you prefer. Uh, he's, of course, not talking about the heaven where he himself lives. The Lord will never shake his own heaven. But the celestial heaven surrounding the earth is the focus here. Here's how the diagram looks. I will shake not only the earth, but also the sky. 
And a case could be made that u and manon should be modifying something within their clause. These are not conjunctions. Manon is an adjective even. It seemed best to me, though, to highlight the function of these phrases as setting up this contrast by bringing them together, the umanon and the ala kai, bringing them together uh, in this conjunction space within the series branch. I wouldn't seriously object to somebody who wanted to diagram constructions like this with umanon as appropriate modifiers within its own clause, and also the kai, so that only the ala ends up in the conjunction slot here. As I say, the way I prefer to do it is more a matter of providing optimal clarity for the nature of the contrasting construction. Sometimes you have a series that has no conjunctions at all. So here's an example. To fit everything onto one slide here, I needed to divide the slide into columns, so our text does not span all the way across the page this time. Sick people heal, dead people raise, lepers cleanse, demons cast out. So these very brief commands here, all in parallel. Freely you received, freely give. Can you picture how that would look in diagram form? Well, there's probably more than one way to put things together, but let's look at it like this. There's an understood you that is the subject of all six of these verbs. So first come the four commands about ministering to people in need, and then come two more clauses, one in the indicative, you freely received, and then one final imperative, freely give. So you see we have a normal series branch here, two of them actually, as I have it set up, but no conjunctions at all because there are no conjunctions in the Greek text over here. When the Greek text has no conjunctions, we simply omit them. Now this verse is an example of another phenomenon as well, where we have subseries. So I have set off freely you received, freely give, not just as two more items in the series of six, but as its own little subseries of two. You see, the nature of these verbs is a little different from the nature of the first four, which speak of ministry to people in need. And there would be yet another way to set up this kind of subseries. We might decide that we want the first four all tied together in a subseries, just like these two are put in a subseries. So we could certainly do that. And it would look like this now. You have your subject. And the verb slot divides first into two major sections, one with the imperatives about ministering to people in need, and then the second pair at the end. That's a very nice visually balanced presentation. Let's go on now to some new symbols in this video. An adverbial clause consists of a finite verb that modifies another verb in the sentence. Usually, and I want to say always, but I sure hesitate to say always when talking about language. Usually, adverbial clauses are introduced by a subordinating conjunction. Now, you notice I've highlighted the expression finite verb. A finite verb is a verb having person and number. The verbs that are not finite verbs are the participles and the infinitives. We'll discuss participle and infinitive clauses separately. Here, we're just talking about full-fledged adverbial clauses with finite verbs. So the diagramming would look like this. Here's your main clause, and modifying the main clause, and therefore diagrammed on a shelf beneath it, is another whole clause, not just a word or a phrase, but another whole baseline with its own subject and verb, and very possibly a complement. And this clause could be extremely complicated, but still it modifies, that whole clause is functioning as a single modifier for its governing verb. So the conjunction is written on the more or less vertical portion of the diagramming symbol, the horizontal portion contains the baseline. Notice the angle coming downward to the right. This is the standard angle for modifiers that contain full-fledged finite verbs. Most of the modifiers we've worked with up to this point, perhaps all of them, have had shelves that slant downward to the left. That angle is used for modifiers that don't have a verb form at all. Participles and infinitives, which as I say we'll discuss separately, uh, use modifier shelves that come down at a right angle. That's the standard Reed-Kellogg convention. To me, it's rather arbitrary, and I'm not uh, greatly concerned about those angles, but this is the standard practice in Reed-Kellogg diagramming. Okay, here's an example. Again, a somewhat longer example, and we'll find that there is more than one adverbial clause in this example. This is Herod instructing the wise men, having gone, inquire carefully about the child. And whenever you find him, 
report to me that I too, having come, may worship him. So here's how the sentence diagram would look. Again, we do have a series of verbs. You is the understood subject referring to the wise men. You seek carefully concerning the child and report to me. The second clause, report to me, has two adverbial clause modifiers. They are to report to him when they find the child, and they are to report to Herod for the purpose that he also may worship him. So we have a temporal clause telling when the wise men should report to Herod, and we have what is sometimes called a final clause. Final is a technical term for something that denotes purpose. So the purpose clause is that Herod too may worship him. Now let's go on to talk about adverbial participles. We'll talk about infinitives in a completely different video, but we will talk about the adverbial participle in this one. Adverbial participles modify a verb and expand upon that verb by providing information that expresses how, when, why, etc. that verb's action or state happens. Now that's a mouthful, and I'm presupposing here that you've had some instruction in Greek participles and that you're at least vaguely aware of what an adverbial participle is. You may need to review that kind of information from whatever textbook you used that presented that material when you were learning. If you've never learned that material, we can hope that it will begin to register with some clarity as you continue to work with Greek in bits and pieces. The diagramming method to show an adverbial participle, as I mentioned a moment ago, is to put the participle on a modifier shelf with the descending portion of the symbol coming down at a right angle to the horizontal shelf. For our example, we can take the sentence we just worked with. Perhaps you noticed when it was on the screen that there were a couple of unusual looking symbols. We had two adverbial participles. Having gone, search accurately concerning the child. And then the purpose clause says, so that I also, having come, may worship him. The specific use of both of these participles would be attendant circumstance. These participles simply accompany their governing verbs as very closely related actions that actually partake of the nature of those governing verbs. So in the first clause, the governing verb inquire is in the imperative, and poruthentes partakes of that imperatival flavor. It's part of the command, go and inquire accurately concerning the child. The second participle, elthone, is in a construction using the subjunctive with a purpose use, here it says, report to me that for the purpose that I may worship him. Well, the coming is part of the purpose, for the purpose that I may come and worship him. So these are just simple attendant circumstance participles. There are a variety of adverbial uses of the participle, means and manner and cause and time and result and purpose and so forth. They would all be diagrammed the same way on a right angle modifier shelf. We're finished with part seven. Happy diagramming.